So my name is Collins Otieno Odiamo. I'm the project lead for the LabCorp uh, project. And I'm going to be your moderator today. So as a short introduction for the session today, so globally diagnostics is the biggest gap in the cascade of care. Uh, the recent Lancet Commission report on diagnostics indicated that uh, only 35 to 65% of the population lack access to diagnostics for the six common medical conditions in low to medium income countries. That includes Africa. The situation is even worse in the primary healthcare level. Diagnostic network optimization, also abbreviated DNO, is an intervention that can allow countries to determine how to provide the greatest access to equitably and timely diagnostic services, while also maximizing overall efficiency of laboratory system. Today, uh, we launched the DNO subcommunity of practice, which will be a dedicated work stream of the main lab corp. This is a collaboration between ASLM and FIND, and the aim is to improve the uptake and the quality of DNO processes in lab corp countries. So in the first session, ASLM and FIND will provide a brief overview and updates on DNO and introduce the subcommunity of practice objectives and processes. Just to let you know, if you have questions uh, during the sessions, please type your questions into the chat box and we will address them at the end of the two presentations that we have today. Also note that we will share these slides uh, through our normal channels. We also have simultaneous uh, translation of this session into French. Uh, our first presenter today is called Jui Gautam. Jui works with FIND as an access officer with the Global Diagnostics Network Optimization Team. She leads coordination of DNO projects in countries, uh, supports capacity building initiatives, and key partnerships that include uh, this DNO subcommittee of practice. Dewey holds a Master of Public Health uh, in Social Epidemiology and has over 10 years experience in planning and implementing health system strengthening programs. So Dewey will give an introduction to find, uh, tackle uh, an overview of DNO and current updates and why uh, this led to the formation of this subcommittee of practice. So I'll welcome Dewey uh, to load her slides and start the presentation. Over. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I, I'm Juhi Gautam, as Collins mentioned. Uh, I'm very happy to speak at this first eco session of the DNO subcommunity of practice. A huge thanks to the SLM team for organizing this. Um, I'll start with a quick introduction to find. Our mission is to drive equitable access to quality diagnostics through technology and access innovations that help further universal health coverage and improve response to health emergencies. So DNO is one unit at FIND under a broader access program that seeks to support countries to ensure impact of existing diagnostic technologies and also new and emerging tools. So the key dimensions of FIND's work are really across improving access to testing, value for money and equity. And DNO really helps maximize impact across all of these dimensions. Uh, I'm speaking today on behalf of uh, the DNO team uh, indicated here on the slide. Some of them I see are also present with us today. Uh, so we are lo located across different countries. We also work with other disease teams that find for specific projects and colleagues from partner organizations. Um, Heidi Albert, who leads our DNO programs, along with Sam Achillum and myself, we form the core team for this subcommunity of practice, along with uh, our ASLM colleagues. So I'd like to start off with some context here on what we mean by DNO. Uh, like Collins was alluding to, it's no, it's no surprise that access to testing is often the weakest link in the care cascade. And we know this is because of many challenges across infrastructure, human resources, funding, um, data, uh, m and et cetera. And DNO, so DNO is basically a geospatial analytics approach to help find solutions to some of these challenges. 
and it is used to guide diagnostic strategies uh, and operational planning. So DNO informs investments and it helps prioritize interventions that have the greatest impact towards achieving national disease goals as well as health equity. Before I proceed with the definition that we have up here, I'd like to call out that this is one perspective to optimizing networks really to making them better that find and partners have been working with and DNO can take various forms. It can be broader or even more specific in nature than how we've defined it here, depending on the questions that we seek to answer. So just to look at the definition, DNO uh, helps analyze the current diagnostic network and identify gaps in the network and then recommend uh, for example, how many devices of what kind are needed, where should they be located, and how should they be supported by our sample referral network where necessary uh, to best meet the testing and access goals while minimizing network costs. In doing so, uh, DNO helps evaluate impact that could be achieved via different types of interventions across three main dimensions. So I'd like to call out firstly improving access, which could mean getting more people tested and getting them uh, access to testing faster. Second, it, the impact would be in terms of increasing network efficiency through uh, lower procurement and operation costs and better prioritization of resources. And thirdly, uh, enhancing equity, which is really by targeting investments towards the greatest need, both in terms of geography and vulnerable populations. So, Basically, what we get out of the DNO process is a set of recommendations for uh, making changes to a diagnostic network. And depending on the scope and context of the analysis, uh, DNO can give us various outputs. Uh, some of them we've mentioned here on the slide from previous DNO analysis. They include uh, procuring new devices or modifying procurement plans, relocating devices to better meet testing demand, establishing or strengthening the sample referral network, so however, these recommendations then need to go on to inform decisions like across policymaking, decisions for lab systems across financing, contracting, procurement, uh, training, and all the other aspects of lab system strengthening. So basically, uh, DNO is really a means to an end and uh, it's, uh, and you know, what all it can do, we will dive deeper into the what and how of DNO in the subsequent uh, sessions. This is just to set the context for uh, today's discussion. Uh, now, moving into where and how has DNO been used up until now? Uh, this is a snapshot of DNO analysis that FINE has been conducting or supporting across disease areas and countries, geographies. Some of these are more recent and work in progress, while work from DNO in other countries uh, have informed funding requests to donor agencies and they have helped shape national strategic plans and guidelines. And maybe just to take an example, Philippines, India, and Kenya, the DNO outputs in, from these analysis, they were used to inform gene expert procurement and device placement plans to best meet the national TB program goals. So uh, what I'd like to uh, call out in this slide here is that DNO can be applied across all disease areas. Uh, it is disease agnostic, while most of the work up until now has been focused on TB on integrated molecular diagnostics. DNO is also being now applied in antimicrobial resistance and um, NTD networks and increasingly starting off in malaria, Lassa yellow fever and expanding genome sequencing um, networks. Uh, so across everything that uh, we do uh, on DNO, there, there are a few things that we aim to do. First is to optimize investments in diagnostics for both patient care and for surveillance. This happens through informing NSPs and investment decisions and through uh, laboratory surveillance network design. Secondly, uh, the, one of the aims is also to deploy open access software tools for mapping and for conducting DNO. OptiDX is one such tool that FIND had developed jointly with USAID at Cooper. And we are also currently exploring other tools. Thirdly, through initiatives such as the SUBCOP, the aim is to build capacity to conduct DNO more broadly and use those findings for decision making. Also to explore strategies that improve the quality and availability of geospatial data for diagnostic networks, because that's really the crux of any analysis that we can conduct. Uh, taking a more future looking outlook, DNO can also be applied to model the impact of upcoming emerging diagnostics so that countries can be better prepared to evaluate and adopt uh, these newer technologies. 
In terms of capacity building on DNO, we will have, like I said, detailed eco sessions through the subcorp and other activities. Uh, I'd like to mention here more broadly, FIND has developed an online self-paced introductory course on DNO for senior decision makers. Uh, this is based uh, on inputs from uh, multiple partners and organizations, and this will be launched soon. The details are provided here. And for those of you who might be interested to know more, please do write to us. Uh, other DNO resources on software tools and other approaches are also available for reference. Uh, this is just to uh, flag out that there, there is already a body of knowledge that's available. And what we now need to do is uh, build off on it. I'd be amiss here if I don't mention that FIND really is a part of the growing ecosystem of partners working on DNO. And there are various recommendations that have been made already to guide effective use of DNO. Um, a few are presented here for reference. There are guidance documents and information notes uh, by WHO, by Global Fund, USAID, and FIND and other partners as well. For example, on how to conduct a DNO and how to apply it to uh, guide selection of, for example, WHO recommended RDTs or preparing funding requests. So all of these are uh, here and you can refer to them uh, if, if, you're, if you're interested to know more. Finally, the reason why all of us are here today, the DNO subcommunity of practice. Um, having collectively made some progress with DNO and geospatial analysis more broadly over the past few years, there is a growing body of knowledge on DNO to learn from, and uh, we're also seeing great potential and interest to adopt it more widely. However, there are also challenges around availability and quality of data, mechanisms to fund and build technical capacities of countries to conduct and sustain geospatial analysis, and the coordination that's really needed across stakeholders to not only conduct analysis that is practical and meaningful, but also to implement the recommendations and uh, you know, sustain the analysis for future planning. So this is where FIND and SLM have joined hands to create the subcorp uh, to promote coordination and exchange of learnings and experiences and identify best practices really for use of geospatial analysis. I'll stop here. Uh, thanks to all our partners and donors for their support. Thank you all for listening. Uh, very excited to launch the subcorp and working with many of you uh, together going forward. I'll hand over now to Margaret, uh, who will take us through the details of the subcorp, its scope and processes. Thank you, everyone. And over to you, Margaret. Yeah, thanks, Jui. So the second presenter is uh, Dr. Margaret Masinga Luambe. She's as a, she works at ASLM as a senior advisor. She holds a PhD in microbiology. She is the chair of the Stop TB Partnership Global Laboratory Initiative Core Group and a laboratory consultant for programmatic management of drug resistance tuberculosis. She has more than 15 years experience working in Africa at the interface of clinical research and national laboratory system reinforcement for better infectious disease control. She aims at fostering better linkages between researchers, policymakers, and national health authorities to ensure better uptake of new recommendations, technologies, and scale up of new diagnostic tools. She will be leading the DNO subcommunity of practice, and she will give us more details of what the subcommunity of practice is about. Over to you, Dr. Masenga Luande. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now coming up specifically to the ASLM, a new newly established diagnostic network subcommunity of practice. What are we talking about? So as a starting point, maybe I will just come back a little bit and introduce or reintroduce the lab cop. So the lab community of practice for strengthening lab network and system, which is led by uh, Dr. Colin Sotieno. And so that uh, community of practice aims to link together country teams. So here on the slide, you see 18, but actually we've reached now 21 country teams from across Africa. And those country teams can network between themselves. They can also network with uh, global expert uh, 
on a regular basis uh, through the eco sessions, but also through dedicated work stream. Uh, the Lab Cop aims to foster south to south knowledge uh, sharing, sharing of experience and be best practices, really to co create um, knowledge uh, for uh, intervention to strengthen lab network and system. And uh, the, the Sub Cop is uh, therefore a segment of the main Lab Cop. And uh, I like to uh, mention that it is the offspring of, of the main lab cop, so to speak. And so why uh, a DNO subcop? So Joey gave a bit of background on diagnostic network optimization, the processes which are involved, uh, what has been done, some of the project in some of the countries in Africa, but why do we need a subcop? So first and foremost, this is a collaboration uh, between ASLM and FIND, uh, still funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And as I just said, it's a dedicated segment. And the aim is the same, to bring together country teams, multidisciplinary and stakeholders, and with a specific focus this time on diagnostic network optimization, really to share the challenges and the best practices uh, for optimizing diagnostic network. And why do we need a DNO subcop? So first, there are many tools, software, and strategies for DNO. Jui presented some of them. I will also be presenting some. And so the conclusion will be that there are many tools out there. There are many ways and approaches to DNO. And so there is a need to identify those approaches which are more suitable to the local context and uh, align with the priorities of the countries. And this will also enable an alignment of expectation from the countries, as well as the offer from the donors and the partners uh, and the knowledge to really increase the effectiveness of diagnostic network optimization and also have a maximum impact uh, for improving um, access to health um, diagnostic services. And ultimately, through those entire action, we aim to improve the uptake and the quality of DNO processes in LabCorp countries and really promote the use of evidence, uh, the use of data to inform intervention for strengthening lab network and system. So diagnostic network optimization, once again, um, I'm referring to the uh, consortium uh, guidance, which was published uh, some time ago. And also there is a good paper by Kameko Nichols and colleague. I will put the reference in the chat box uh, and I would invite you to refer to that paper if you need more information on definition uh, around DNO. But basically there are, there are four key steps involved in DNO. The first one is to define the scope and um, to ensure alignment of the stakeholders, the countries, the partners, the different parties involved in, in the, the diagnostic network optimization exercise. Once that has been achieved, there is a need to collect if it's not already available data. So data about lab networks, data about lab system. And so that is called the mapping exercise. And this will enable the special, special analysis of the data because that data, those data that we are collecting have to be geolocalized. So not only you are aware of what capacity you have within your network, but you can also um, specify exactly where that capacity is located. Once the special analysis has been run, uh, you can select scenario for optimizing your lab network. So this is based on modeling. You, you run different scenario depending on your use case. If you want to expand access, for example, you can choose area where you plan to access and see how you can be more efficient in that approach. And once the best scenario has been selected, the last step is the one of implementation. So you have different scenario, you choose the one which is uh, the most, um, not convenient, but the most efficient for the purpose, the use case. And then you need to implement, implement the change and see, monitor if the proposed change are really contributing to improving your lab network and improving access to diagnostics. So ASLM has been involved in, in mapping the mapping step, so that is the first and the second step uh, of, of uh, DNO. And this has been done in the scope of the strategic objective of Africa CDC, and specifically those of the lab division to really map, have an overview of pre-existing capacities for lab network and lab system in Africa. So that is in all AU member states. And the, the, the processes that ASLM has been um, supporting, so the countries have been uh, contacted via a not verbal, and those who have accepted those processes have been laid out. So there was the training of the data collector, 
there was a step of data collection. Then the data which has been collected has to be curated. It can be visualized and therefore, once available, it can be used for analysis uh, to really for planning of the lab network. And um, once that cycle has been completed, there is also uh, the need to provide uh, regular updates to the repository of data. We've seen with the COVID-19 pandemic, the configuration of lab networks has really changed. It has really evolved. So there is a need to capture also the changes within your lab network. And so the mapping include the following processes. So uh, the first step is the one of data collection. As I mentioned, the data collectors are going on the field to capture the data. And this is the geolocalized data. It's done uh, simply, it can be done with a tablet, it can be done with a phone through uh, an app. Uh, one thing which is important, it has been mentioned, DNO is disease agnostic. So ideally, you would capture as much uh, data as you can on all uh, area of, of diagnostics and not just for, for one disease. So here, uh, the tool is available on ASLM uh, website and you can see the different information which are being um, collected. So there is the lab profile, there is information about workforce, equipment, etc. So all of that is being done and it's across more than 100 uh, uh, diagnostics uh, disease. Once the data has been uh, collected, it, it has to be curated, it is being cleaned, and then it can be transferred to a repository, um, which is called a resource map. So this is where the data is being uh, collected and it is being kept. And uh, there is also uh, an option of visualizing the data. So it can be uh, shared uh, on the internet via a, a, a portal and uh, the country decides uh, what portion of the data can be made uh, available to the public for wide use. And um, there is also the option of using the data for analysis with different software. The one that ASLM has been using is PlanWise. And it's uh, allowing to triangulate the layers of information. So your geolocalized data with your population data, your road network, et cetera. And using all those parameters, it is possible to then run model to optimize your lab network. ASNM has an approach to really support the countries in doing. So the ownership ultimately is with the country um, and, and, and the bulk of the work is done by the country. And so at the level of data collection, ASLM support consists in a country engagement, as I said, uh, in collaboration with Africa CDC and then uh, training the teams for data collection. The country on the other end has to designate a lab map focal person and is in charge of doing the data collection, both for the baseline collection and also especially for the updates. Um, the, at the step of data curation, ASLM uh, IT team uh, are supporting data cleaning and then they share back um, the data set with the country. And uh, at that stage also, the data, the data team, a data team is identified at the level of the country who can be trained on the process processes for data cleaning and also for updates to the resource map, so to the data repository. And um, at the step of data visualization and use, uh, ASLM is setting up the portal, uh, training the team, as I said, and migrating uh, the data from the resource map to the repository to the public portal, according to the parameters selected by the country. And ultimately, the country is responsible for hosting the public portal and the resource map. They have to designate a data administrator, and they are the point of entry for uh, uh, determining the use cases for the data, but also for access to the data. Here you can see the current status of the country who have been supported um, through um, the collaboration with Africa CDC uh, by ASLM. Uh, you can see here a number of countries. Some of them are a lab cop country. Other might be located in areas in Africa where there was less visibility on lab network and system. And so there was this need really to uh, increase um, the, the availability of lab related data. This slide summarizes uh, the data use and analysis. So once the data has been collected, once it is in the resource map, what do we do with it? So you have different parameters that can be considered. Like I said, you have the road network, you have the population, you also have the disease prevalence. So not all countries will have the same priority. It depends on the local burden of disease. Uh, one of the key elements is the available budget for improving your lab network and then the capacity of your lab uh, 
the need to increase uh, most often that capacity. And so uh, to put it very simply, <laughs> like uh, Julie mentioned that we will be uh, dwelling in more detail into the analysis uh, during subsequent presentation. But um, just as a, a very simple illustration, you run an algorithm uh, to respond to your what if. So your scenario is what if I want to expand access to viral load testing, for example, that could be one use case. And what, where are your gaps? And you run that algorithm, that modeling, which enables you to really answer that question. And the result is really an optimized network configuration. And all in all, I took the example of, of HIV, but ideally you want to optimize um, uh, versus the universal health coverage. So the needs at country level for uh, ensuring universal health coverage and also uh, the need uh, for uh, providing efficient uh, outbreak response. In, in line with the international health regulation. So out of the key steps, uh, the four steps that I've presented, um, one of the gap, the bottleneck currently is the one of implementation of changes and monitoring of impact related to DNO. So the, the, there have been uh, modeling exercise, DNO exercise, which have been done, scenarios have been run, scenarios have been selected, but then um, uh, implementation uh, does not follow uh, immediately, not necessarily. And so really, what is the problem statement now? So we know uh, we've had the Lancet Commission on Diagnostics. We've also recently, more recently, had the Lancet Commission on COVID-19. And we know that laboratory networks uh, in Africa do not effectively deliver services for clinical and public health functions. And generally, those services are not equitably available or accessible to the population. An investment for optimizing laboratory network uh, in the specific context of limited resources are lacking, and they are not driven uh, by relevant geolocalized data on laboratory capacity. At the level of, of the funders and, and the technical agency, there is an alignment now to really emphasize the need for data-driven investment and data-driven intervention. Um, just a, a few days ago, uh, PEPFAR um, published their um, updated uh, st strategic direction, and they highlighted the need to strengthen the capacity of, of uh, regional and national public health institution by really improving the capacity for data management, data collection to improve laboratory system. Likewise, during the 72 second um, regional committee of the WHO AFRO, uh, there was really an emphasis among their uh, strategic objective to really first identify gaps and based on those gaps, use evidence for planning. And so gap and identification should be conducting, conducted using relevant assessment of which there are many, there are the GEE, but there are also specific assessment and those should form the, the basis for planning. And uh, uh, more lately also, we've had uh, now the NFM4, so the funding cycle for the Global Fund uh, has been initiated and among uh, the guidance that the Global Fund has uh, provided to the country uh, under uh, resilient uh, diagnostic um, system, there is really uh, that impetus to routinely conduct integrated DNO and ass assessment exercise to really increase efficiency and effectiveness of laboratory network and system and inform investment. So what are we proposing in the scope of the DNO subcop? So the theory of action is the following, is really to promote data-driven investment for effective laboratory network um, optimization. Um, this will begin with assessing the availability and the utilization of data at country level on lab network and function. Uh, do country have access to uh, accurate and up-to-date information about lab network and system? And what are their guidance and their policy to, to use those? Uh, we will be supporting uh, the consolidation of the national system uh, for geolocalized data, and also uh, strive to identify specific use cases for DNO. And this will be done in the, in the scope of the, of the sub-community of practice, whereby uh, all the country teams, all the participants and the stakeholders will be able to share best practices and experience for DNO and also for the use of the output of DNO. So for also implementation of, of, of DNO, the changes which are proposed. And we hope uh, through this um, community, sub-community of practice to really 
um, have the following outputs, so up-to-date and country-owned uh, GIS database on land capacity and function, uh, improved national capacity for diagnostic network optimization, analytics and intervention, and also ultimately have national plans and funding requests, which will be continuously informed by uh, DNO outputs. And the outcome should be improve equitable uh, access to diagnostic, increase laboratory networks efficiency, and improve patient and public health outcome. If we want to illustrate what this would look like, here you have the DNO ecosystem in Africa, where uh, through that uh, high-level uh, AU endorsement, nationally owned and collected uh, data are, are being uh, made available at country level, and they are really routinely uh, updated. And this should ultimately be a sustainable uh, exercise. And through the support of various partners and donors, uh, there is that possibility to get support for uh, data analytics, modeling, um, and, and running of scenario to really propose those changes which are data driven. And the step that we want to achieve uh, through the DNO subcop is really to increase the use of analysis and modeling outputs to guide planning and to guide decision making for laboratory network and system. So what is the way forward now? How should we go, uh, you as uh, LabCorp country teams, uh, us as um, partners, how should we go forward? So first, there is the need to uh, define the required expertise within country teams. Uh, Dr. Collins mentioned that the, the, the country teams are composed, they're multi-sectoral, uh, you have the TB, uh, you have the HIV, you have the lab directorate, et cetera. But do we need extra capacity in those country teams to be able to run efficiently uh, diagnostic network uh, optimization. And we could consider data manager, modelers and analysts. Maybe there is the need to involve the specifically the health and uh, data and statistic division within the Ministry of Health or elsewhere, if it's located elsewhere, and maybe other needs that you could um, help us to define. And also, uh, there is the, the opportunity to leverage to ongoing activities to strengthen lab network and system, which are being done in the scope of the lab cop. Uh, so I mentioned that uh, lab mapping has been happening in 18 countries. It's still ongoing. Uh, you have also access to gap and maturation assessment, to name but a few. There is the lab net scorecard. There is the viral load self-assessment self and others. Uh, you have ongoing country level activity uh, with different topics. You can have uh, the essential diagnostic list. Uh, you have viral load cascade uh, optimization. Uh, you have the need to expand access to TB diagnostic. There is uh, the AMR surveillance, which is being supported and put in place. And so based on those ongoing activities, we have the opportunity to define use cases for DNO can be related to access, to coverage, to integration across diseases, uh, uh, optimizing sample referral or others that you could help us define once again here. And based on this, uh, especially in, in the wake of the annual uh, lab COP meeting, which will be happening in, in less than two weeks from now, uh, there is that opportunity to really include uh, evidence-based uh, work plan for funding. So in those work plans that you are in the process of finalizing, there is that, that opportunity to include some activities specific for diagnostic network optimization and obtain uh, support uh, through the various uh, software and teams uh, to, to really run those uh, scenario and ultimately implement them. So I will stop here. I would like to really thank uh, the ASLM lab map team. That's the, really a big team which has been very active uh, uh, all over Africa. Instead, which is the partner for, for uh, lab map and plan wise, also Resolve to Save Life, which has been uh, funding um, the, the, the data collection more recently. But I would like to highlight that this has also been supported by IDDS and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, I would like to thank uh, the ASLM LabCorp team, uh, the ASLM and Find DNO project teams, African Union and Africa CDC. And if you want to learn more about diagnostic network optimization and have access to different resources, it can be publication, it can be uh, video, I, I would invite you to visit the ASLM uh, subcop website. And on this, I will stop here. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Margaret, and thank you, um, Yui, for two great presentations. Uh, 
ladies and gentlemen, if you have any question, uh, please post them onto the chat box. Uh, thank you, Heidi, for attempting to uh, answer some of them, and we will revisit a few. Uh, to Yuhi and Margaret, I think we missed something about how to join. So there are two questions from Kenya and Cameroon, and they are asking that they did not see um, themselves on that map that you presented. So maybe talk about this more and explain how countries can join going forward. So Joey and then Marguerite. Uh, thanks, Carlos. Yes, so I think uh, on one of the slides that we had presented, so like Heidi mentioned in the chat as well, we are working in Kenya currently and it is represented on that map. But I think What's important here is that there are different kinds of activities going on within the geospatial space, so to speak. And uh, it's it's important. I mean, that's exactly why we have come together, uh, uh, you know, at, at a plat platform like this to kind of assess what is it that has been done already. Uh, we don't need a full-fledged DNO you know, everywhere. If we have, uh, you know, the 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 lab laboratories mapped out. Uh, if we have. Uh, you know, an X percent of work already completed, we can build off on that. So I just wanted to respond to that point that it's very much there and we are working in Kenya. Um, in terms of joining the lab cup, maybe I think, Margaret, is that a question you would like to take on? Or would you like me to go ahead? Thanks, Julie. Thank you. Margaret. So, yeah, yeah, thanks, Collins. Uh, yeah, thank you. So, as I've explained, uh, the subcop is an offspring of the lab cop. And so, if that is the case, if you've joined already the lab cop, so the lab cop country teams will be de facto member of the DNO subcop um, and they will be invited to join if they want to include uh, activities around DNO in their. Uh, um, country work plan, they will have the possibility to do so. Now, for those countries which are, are not yet part of the lab cop, I would invite you to visit the ASLM uh, webpage for the lab cop. It has all the details, uh, in, including how to join the lab cop, who to reach out to, and uh, what documents are required. But basically, it's done through uh, the Ministry of Health. Over to you, uh, Collins. Thank you. Thanks, Margaret. In the same vein, maybe you want to talk about how to access lab map there's a question related to that thank you so um lab map is available so the through different uh, ways. Uh, there, there was the possibility at the inception to join lab map uh, through the Africa Union Africa CDC uh, because they were um not verbal which were sent to the countries and those country who uh, accepted to join uh, were included in the initial mapping. Uh, the initial mapping uh, consisted in mapping the higher level of the lab network. So level four and level three, that would be the national level and maybe a bit of the provincial level. Uh, for the lab cup countries, uh, as I've just mentioned, they have the possibility to include that in their uh, work plan and their funding um, application if funding can be um, approved, then there would be that possibility to really um, go forward with uh, lab mapping. And I would like to highlight that lab mapping can also be twinned to, um, how should I say, regular activities of, 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 of lab network and system, like throughout the supervision visit, etc. You have the possibility to have data collector trains and to have the data collection uh, undertaken. Hey, thanks, Margaret. Um, there's another question on how often we should uh, conduct DNO. Is it a one-off? Is it uh, annually? Uh, do we use it to monitor efficiencies within the network on a regular capacity? So maybe, Julie, you want to take this and Margaret can add? Sure, happy to. Uh, so I think, again, this is a question that Heidi has responded to in the chat to summarize that. Uh, DNO is not ideally intended to be a one-time exercise because what we get is um, a, a basically a, a, a digital model of your network, which can be then easily updated. It should be uh, updated anytime there is a significant change in the network. Uh, it can be annually. It can be if, if there is a if there is a, you know a, an increase in testing capacity if there are new devices procured for example or there is a new testing algorithm that needs to be uh, sort of rolled out so basically the answer is that it should be uh, it, it should be sustained it is an exercise that should be conducted 
periodically. Now, the periodicity is something that depends on the country, depends on the resources available and um, what status the, uh, the, the network is in currently. So that would be a response to that. Uh, not sure if, Matri, do you want to add anything to it? Margaret? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, like I, I, I included in my presentation, I think it is key to distinguish what, which steps are we talking about when we're talking of DNO. So first, there is the, the data collection and the need to have that data collection updated, because this is what is informing now the analysis that we will run and the modeling that we will do. And data collection has to be done regularly. Uh, it can be embedded in the regular activities of, of uh, the National Public Health Lab or the uh, lab directorate, meaning the supervision visits. So the baseline is more uh, effort and intensive, but the update should, should be more easy because you're capturing the new development. Um, how often do you need to do that? Well, it depends. So we've just mentioned, for example, the COVID-19 pandemic really caused a, a, a major reconfiguration of lab network and system. So there was that need to capture uh, this evolution. Uh, but maybe you will go uh, through uh, a less frequent um, uh, schedule, so to speak, to, to update your, your uh, lab map, your resource map, uh, depending on how quickly your, your lab network and system are evolving. Now for running analysis and, and scenario, you can do that depending on the need, but what is important and what we should not forget is also that you need to implement. Because once you've run those scenarios, once you've selected what we call the output, the, so the, the result of the modeling, how do you implement that? And how do you monitor that? And how do you ensure that your lab network is indeed improved and that access to diagnostics is indeed also uh, improve. So you have that need to look back at what you've done. And so I would say that Yes, you can run uh, the DNO uh, on, on, a, on, on a recurrent basis, but you also need to pay attention to measuring uh, the, the outcome of, of doing the diagnostic network optimization. Over. Thank you, Marguerite. Uh, while presenting, you mentioned uh, some documents from uh, PEPFA, a strategic document, and we are lucky to have George here. So George, maybe at this point, you want to talk about DNO in the perspective of uh, over. Okay, thank you uh, so much, uh, colleagues. I wasn't meant to speak today, uh, but we are so excited with this uh, launch of the DNO subcommittee uh, by the African Society of Medicine and uh, FINE. Uh, we all know the importance of uh, DNO that has been mentioned throughout the presentation. And we saw what happened with countries that had uh, these systems in place during uh, COVID. They were able to leverage these resources to support COVID testing and also uh, strengthen other systems. So we fully support that. Um, within the IDC that you know I coach here with um, SMICA, we continue to do this at a bigger level, but it's so exciting to see how ASLM and FINE have now moved this down to the community. So it's very, very important because taking it down to that broader group is where we want to be so that all countries continue to leverage this uh, DNO uh, resources. I, I'm, I'm glad uh, you, you did mention the PEPFA um, strategic uh, direction document that was just launched. Uh, this is very, very critical. Um, Ambassador uh, John Kengasong has this big vision. Uh, he strongly support um, uh, strengthening lab systems across the board, and also the need for us to broaden our lab capacity, which to stop being siloed, which to see lab as integrated and across diseases, to support uh, global health uh, security and pandemic preparedness. So just having uh, this in place is at the right moment. Uh, PEPFA strongly, you know, over the years, we've been a strong uh, supporter of uh, lab systems, uh, supporting the DNO, integrated diagnostics, and so on. So this is the right place to be, and we we'll look forward to seeing how we can work closely with SLM and FINE to move this forward. So thank you so much. Thank you, George. Uh, okay, so we continue with the questions. So for Marguerite, uh, there's a question uh, on your presentation about what you meant by laboratory capacity. So the question is, is it based on equipment or trained staff or other, other factors? Go ahead. 
Thank you, Collins. It's it's comprehensive. So first, you want to know where the, the, the laboratory is. So that is the location. Then you want to know what is within that laboratory. So of course, equipment is part of it. But you also would need to know what is the testing menu. So how many tests are being performed in that lab? Who is running those tests? So the workforce. Um, what is um, the level of biosafety, biosecurity? Because you might have a lab which has a higher level, but is not yet operating to that level. So once you're positioning your equipment, you know whether you can go there or not, or whether you need to improve or not. That's just an example to be really practical. Um, yeah, so these are all the, 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 the parameters which are um, captured. I, uh, I, I mentioned the testing menu, yes. So, but I would really invite the people to look at the uh, ASLM website um, because, like I said, it's open source that that document, so you can consult it. And there is also the possibility to really um, it it is adaptable. So currently, it is in in, in, in a given format, but there is uh, that possibility to adapt it uh, according to the use cases and the needs of the countries. I hope I've answered the question. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, to both of you, I think there's a question on how the private sector and manufacturers can also participate in the subcommittee of practice for DNA. So how would uh, manufacturers and private sector uh, support DNA initiatives uh, within countries? So either of you can take the question. Okay, maybe I can start uh, eventually. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so optimization has to do with leveraging the capacity which exists in the countries. Again, going back to the lessons of COVID-19, we've seen it. We've seen how not only the national public health sector, so you start with your national public health lab, usually when you're the Minister of Health, but you also go where the capacity exists because this is how you're being efficient. This is how you avoid duplication. And this is how you bring together uh, the, uh, the expertise in the country. And of course, the private sector is one of those sectors that you would uh, wish to involve. Um, and I'm always bringing back also that point that you have the civilian sector. Oftentimes you have the military sector also, uh, which is well equipped uh, to do uh, diagnosis. Uh, you might have also the one health approach. Uh, we've seen it again with COVID-19, whereby uh, veterinary lab uh, were leveraged to support um, access to diagnostic scale up uh, for COVID-19 testing. So um, this is one of the approach that you can use to improve um, uh, access to diagnostics. Thank you. Juhi, do you have anything to add? No, I think that covers from my side. Thanks, Collins. Okay, thank you both. Uh, the next question is actually about data sharing. So Kenneth from Kenya mentions that data sharing uh, is the likely bottleneck in terms of um, making or pushing the agenda for DNO in the countries. What would you say about that? Margaret and then Juhi, data sharing. Okay, sorry, I was I was looking at the questions. Those are interesting in the chat box. Yeah, so data sharing, um, I presented that. Uh, I, I've, I've really mentioned that the resource map is at the level of the Ministry of Health. Um, there is an agreement, of course, uh, when we start uh, working with the Ministry of Health, there has to be an agreement uh, in place uh, because uh, the ASLM teams uh, are supporting data cleaning. They are supporting uh, the setup of the resource map and, and the setup of, of the country portal. But ultimately, this is country only. So the resource map, once the data administrator has been identified at the level of the country, um, the Ministry of Health or the designated unit uh, within the Ministry of Health or elsewhere in the government, uh, which has to be in charge of the data, uh, are the entry point to get access to the lab mapping data and also for conducting the analysis and the, the DNO exercise. Uh, but maybe uh, uh, Fine can also uh, provide some insight as to how they were, um, how they conducted their DNO analysis and access to data. Over. Thank you. Shaman, thanks. Please, thanks. So basically with FIND, as I'd mentioned, we'd been using um, uh, two tools really in, in our DNO uh, projects. So one is 
Coupa, uh, one is supply chain Kuru, which is really a proprietary software. Uh, and then there is OptiDX that we jointly develop. And uh, for both of these tools, what is done is it's, it's a similar process that we follow that eventually it's the country uh, which is the data owner that is, especially with OptiDX, we do have a, a, a data privacy agreement that we sign off on. And which means that if one, eventually all the models, all the data that exists is cannot be shared or replicated or used, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, without explicit uh, you know, uh, permission. So that's that's in place. And uh, of course, there is data available in the public domain that can also be used because a point here is how do we protect data misuse, but also how do we actually enable data sharing in a way that is um, th th that actually promotes um, uh, promotes this practice because. Uh, like on, on the one hand is the siloed implementation that we do keep talking about and then obviously there is th there are valid concerns around use of um, uh, so, sort of cross use of data between between countries between projects so I'd say that there are safeguards in place um, and in, in the approach that we've been using uh, we are also kind of looking at how do we actually make data you know, more available and, and what sort of data can be made more available in the form of, say, public repositories that countries can use when there is lack of uh, actual data that's collated through surveys, for example. So there are two elements to that part I'd like to bring in. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, Joseph from Tanzania is asking uh, whether DNO and integration uh, are intertwined. So maybe you want to talk about that, Margaret, DNO and integration. Yes, thank you. So integration is indeed a work stream of ASLM, which is becoming more and more prominent. And that is one way of being more efficient and of optimizing a, a diagnostic network. So that is one of the use cases, actually. So uh, let's say you have a, a laboratory which is equipped to do uh, diagnostics for TB, especially for with the rapid molecular test. Um, okay, let me just take the example of the region where I am based. So that is Central Africa and, and the specific molecular uh, platform, which can be used both for TB, HIV, Ebola, COVID-19. So really, if you want to be efficient, if you have a facility who can do uh, TB diagnostics, maybe you would aim to also integrate those other tests on that same platform or at the same location, at least, such that for the population, they have access. It's a one-stop shop. If they need testing for either one of those diseases, they can go there. So that is a use case, but you need to define whether it's cost efficient to do that, whether it's possible, and that's where you will do your DNO and also where you will uh, integrate those tests. Um, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Dewey, you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I see we are running short of time, so I probably will, wouldn't go into a lot of detail around this, but uh, completely uh, would like to agree with what Margaret just mentioned. Uh, we do have, we've had some experience with uh, using OptiDX, for example, in testing scenarios that integrate um, uh, TB and HIV testing on existing gene expert platforms. This was conducted in Zambia recently, and uh, this is just one of the examples. Uh, there are other diseases that have been sort of taken in an integrated fashion. And what we what's what's important and useful, I guess, to remember here is also that it's not just about integrating testing on multi-disease platforms. It's also about, for example, using sample referral networks for one disease to kind of uh, expand coverage for other diseases, wherever it makes sense. So in the case of Zambia, for example, there were clear access benefits in terms of reduction of distances over which samples were being transferred, especially for HIV, um, uh, viral load, and, and NEID tests in, in some regions, where at baseline samples were trans being transported over long distances. And then there were scenarios that were modeled which kind of integrated uh, this priority uh, testing, uh, HIV testing, on gene expert platforms. And uh, the model demonstrated that there will be cost and access and efficiency benefits. So uh, the, the findings are being currently worked on and the implementation, again, like we've all been talking about, it's, it's, it's the, the, the challenge and the, the impact both is in the implementation, but absolutely uh, integration is, uh, is, is a fundamental use case for DNO, I'd say. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both. Uh, I see we are almost at the top of the hour. So I just want to ask 
uh, the last question to both of you uh, about um, the mapping uh, and what, how, how does touch shifting uh, come about or how is it taken care of by DNO? So there is a, a move uh, to have diagnostics uh, go to the community so that we increase access. So when we do uh, this diagnostic network optimization, do we also include that part of the lab? Over to you. I can take a stab at that, I think, Colin. So uh, from, from what I understand, what you are, uh, maybe I can reframe the question. I think the question really is around uh, what are, so basically what are the uh, strategies that sort of bring testing closer to communities and how does DNO help us expand yes. on that? Correct. Okay. Yes. So uh, absolutely. So this is again, the, I think this is one of the what if scenarios that we love to talk about. Currently, for example, testing might be located at a certain level of the multi-tiered laboratory structure that we are all familiar with. And uh, for example, in, 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 in the ongoing analysis in Pakistan, we are considering uh, the use of uh, mobile vans and x-rays in, in chest x-rays through mobile vans and how, where does it make most sense to sort of bring that in along with the uh, lab-based uh, infrastructure. And yes, uh, these, these strategies, I think, are being implemented uh, in, in, a, in, in, many, in many countries and in many places. I think what DNO helps do is where would it have the most impact and how much impact can we, so sort of quantifying that impact of bringing testing closer to communities in terms of uh, more tests done versus uh, the costs it would take and how what, what would it mean for uh, the overall network in terms of utilization and efficiency. So I think that's what um, we have been looking at uh, and I, I'll stop here. I'll see if uh, anybody else has any feedback on that. Thank you. Thank you, Dewey. Uh... Last question to Bagarit. Uh, Blessing uh, mentions that DNO, he has only heard about DNO at the country context. Uh, can it be used as in the regional context, maybe for, for things uh, like genomic sequencing? Yeah, thank you, uh, Collins, and thank you, Blessing, for that question. Yes, I think, and this was the entry point also for Africa CDC when the mapping uh, was beginning, and it was aligned with the RealSnet, which is an integrated uh, network for uh, laboratories and surveillance, really to map uh, the capacity within the region and uh, in the specific case of uh, outbreak response and response to epidemic and pandemic, how can we be most efficient to respond to the country? Because we know that um, resources are needed to set up uh, capacity, especially when it's uh, uh, advanced testing like sequencing. And you need to balance that with um, the costs that are related to referring to a neighboring center uh, of, of, of excellence who can do the testing for you. And so this is the approach which has been used. And it is, it, it, it is also um, a type of DNO uh, because you need to factor in your um, the, the referral mechanism, the distances, et cetera, and the capacity on the various sites. And, and based on the scenario, you select what is more optimal to really provide testing timely in the case of outbreak response. Over. Thank you so much for that answer. So uh, I think we should wrap up now. So I'll give uh, Dewey one minute uh, to summarize. And then Margaret, you can also summarize what we expect to see uh, in the next coming few weeks in the subcorp. Over to you, Dewey. Thank you, Collins. Uh... It was, it was, it was, I think it was a wonderful discussion today. It's a kickoff. So we expect a lot more uh, in terms of both technical details and understanding around, you know, but more importantly, like Margaret was mentioning, what would make most sense for our member countries, for uh, the audiences here? I think that's what we would like to drive at. That's what we would like to focus on in the coming few weeks. We will be meeting again uh, at the SLM uh, annual meeting, and there will be more discussions around how do we take this approach and turn it into, um, a, into a practical sort of, not a one size fits all approach, but really how do we take this concept and turn it into something that countries would uh, want to you know, implement and, and, and experiment with. So I look forward to doing that in this subcop. Um, 
And thanks so much again for the opportunity to interact with everyone today. Thanks, Collins. Thanks, Julie. Margaret? Yeah, thank you. I think recently there has been a lot of emphasis on the need to put in place a systems approach as opposed to interventions which are more focused. So really, how can we lift uh, the healthcare system as, 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 as one and how can we lift uh, laboratory uh, networks and system as well uh, to really have that resilience at country level to be able to provide adequate uh, access to testing uh, for universal healthcare, but also for our break response. And so um, this effort for uh, using evidence base uh, to increase uh, the capacity uh, in the country level uh, to, for, for intervention, which are based on evidence uh, on DNO uh, is aligned with that. And now what will happen is that in my slides, there were many, we are looking forward to, you know, others, others. So this is really information that needs to come now from the country team. And we really invite uh, the country team to provide feedback. Uh, we will continue with the usual uh, processes of the lab COP. So um, of course there are engagement through the echo sessions. There is also the country visit where we can discuss with the country team. Uh, we will be also uh, elaborating um, uh, knowledge uh, uh, tools, uh, the lab cup recipe, the publication, etc. And we really encourage also South to South collaboration for the waste management. We've seen how this has been successful. We hope to achieve the same for diagnostic network optimization and um, elaboration of country work plan, application for funding and mobilization of resources also to really uh, scale up uh, DNO uh, in the different country is what we're aiming for. And as Julie mentioned, uh, the lab cup uh, annual meeting is really our milestone to come together and um, come up with concrete uh, action to move this forward. Um, yeah, so over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Margaret and Julie. So this is a good place to stop. Uh, thank you uh, to the audience for being um, active and sharing your questions. And we hope that through this subcop, we'll be able to answer some of the questions that you have raised in more detail. Otherwise, uh, do have a good day a good evening, a good night, wherever you are. Thank you for joining.